Are we as a species arrogant or naive to think that given there could be so many of these Earth-like planets that are we naive to think that we're potentially alone, do you think? Well, yeah, the, the, this is this is this problem because there should be lots out there. Mm -hmm. And something should have by now been able to pretty much colonise the universe. So when we turn our radio telescopes up there and we listen, we should hear, you would think, yep. some noise from that. But we don't. Of them. Look on the ASA. My gosh. They're all going against the wind. The wind's 120 knots from the west. Oh, okay, that thing, dude. That's not our LNS, though, is it? It's not. That is an LNS, dude. Well, if there's like a thing, it's rotating. Nickel 6 1 Tango, Mod J. Roger. Hi Chris, thanks for joining us here today. We're at the planetarium at QV Mag. Can you tell us a bit about what your role is here and what are the day-to-day -day operations of the planetarium? Well, um, there's a lot to do in a planetarium. There's a lot more than just running shows. Uh, and that is a, certainly a big part of it. We run public shows and uh, we also do a lot of uh, school and other special interest groups. Mm -hmm. um, so that can keep me busy. But we have a reasonably complex optomechanical projector there, which does need a significant amount of maintenance to keep it going. It's uh, over 20 years old now, and uh, that keeps me busy. There's also alterations to the other digital projection systems and making up content. And it's, there's never a, a dull moment. Uh, there's a lot to do in a planetarium. And obviously there's a lot of interest in this piece of equipment. Can you tell us? Just a little bit about it. That is our Zeiss star projector. A um, bit of a Frankenstein's monster. We've, uh, I'm making one up out of two. Okay. Uh, we've managed to uh, get uh, two of the same model. Uh, what The second one had a few extras that our first one didn't, both second hand of course. Uh, mm -hmm. This is what we project our night sky with for the live section of the show, which is the most important part of any planetarium show. Yeah, people, yeah, the digital projection is good and we can have movies and that, but the highlight of any planetarium show is when we fire up the Zeiss and do the live presentation about what people can actually see tonight from here. Oh, and we can show it from other parts of the world as well. But it's a, it's a great old machine, over 20 years old now. But a machine like that, in the middle of the room, taking up the best bit of real estate, a lot of planetariums have got rid of their star projectors because they've gone fully digital. Okay. And I don't want to do that because this looks like a planetarium. Yep. People come in, everyone is fascinated by the machine. It looks the part. It's recognisable. It is. Yep. And it gives it a sort of a, a TARDIS effect of this odd looking gadget in the middle of the room where uh, yeah, it should be like the, the console. Nice. Yeah. Very impressive. Now, over the past few years, we've seen a bit of a growth in interest in space exploration. We've seen America put a rover on Mars. We've seen the Chinese follow suit. Then we had the International Space Station, and now China's put a space station in orbit. Have you noticed there's been a, a bit of a growing interest in the community in astronomy and space as such? It, it probably does come in waves. Uh, obviously, if there's something big has happened, there is a spike in the interest. But there's always a lot of interest in, uh, in astronomy. Uh, going back even to when I, and I think you mentioned earlier yourself, were kids. Mm -hmm. yep. um, there's always been things happening. Well, basically, I'm a child of the space age, yep. born around about the same time as Sputnik went up. Um, so, yeah, we've always had a lot of interest in, in space and astronomy. Uh, we do get spikes, as, as we mentioned, uh, the, the Mars uh, landings just recently have 
made a bit more interest in Mars itself. Mm -hmm. uh, and it, it makes people these days, of course, we live in urban situations with lots of light pollution. Uh, people don't see the sky like uh, previous generations did when they had darker skies and uh, they relied on the, on the moon, for example, to work at night. Mm -hmm. um, so people need to be reminded that there is an amazing universe out there and we're in it. Uh, it's easy to forget when you're looking at a computer screen all day. Even more recently, we've seen a fair bit of buzz in the media around some videos that the US Department of Defence released um, of what people, some people believe to be UFOs or UAPs. Um, what's your take on what you've seen so far? Well, the unidentified part is fair enough. We don't know what these things were, so they're unidentified. Whether they're Flying, uh, as you know, if you want to split hairs about what flying means, mm -hmm. uh, that's uh, probably why the newer designation of uh, unidentified aerial phenomena is uh, sort of taking some precedence. Um, they're unidentified, they're in the air, so they exist in that sense. What they are, though, is a bit more problematic. Mm -hmm. uh, it is possible that some of them may be, uh, uh, you know, there's been some talk of hypersonic aircraft that yep. maybe the, uh, the Russians and the Chinese are uh, developing. And maybe the Americans, if they were developing them, they'd say, oh, well, we know nothing about it because this stuff is top secret. That's possibly some of it. Some of it would just be misidentified normal phenomena. Yep. There is, over time, there has been a, a, a number of certainly interesting uh, reports, but if they're alien spacecraft, which is what everyone wants them to be, <laughs> um, there's a lot of problems there. Yep. Yeah, with our current understanding of the laws of physics, Mm -hmm. It is very difficult to see how spacecraft could come here from any other star system. The closest star to the Sun, and to, therefore to the Earth after the Sun, is uh, Alpha Centauri, the brightest of the two pointers pointing to the Southern Cross. And that's 4.3 light years away from us. So if we could travel at the speed of light, it would take 4.3 years to get there. You might say, well, that's not that long. Yeah. But we but, can't travel at the speed. But when we're a fair way from that, aren't we? Even yeah. If... Uh, at the moment, it would take many thousands of years for some of our technology to get there. Uh, it's conceivable that you could probably get it down to a, a few hundred years. Uh, but to move physical objects, faster than the speed of light would appear to be impossible mm -hmm. and to even go at the speed of light unless you are light is pretty near impossible as far as we can tell. So there's a big problem of where these things can come from. Now that doesn't mean to say that it's impossible but it's we can't see how well, our happen. understanding yeah. is that we can't do yeah. that. Now, it's been reported that the US government is going to release imminently a report into these videos and sightings and the such. Um, based on what you've said, are you expecting anything explosive to come out of there? Can you foresee something earth-shattering? I, I, I don't think that we'll be presented with evidence of alien life visiting us. Mm -hmm. um, like it'd be great, it'd be great if it uh, <laughs> did, because this is another big problem, which I can talk about in a moment. But yeah, there, it'd be good to see some interesting footage. I've had a look at uh, some that have been released already, and yeah, the ones that I've seen. Uh, uh, 
it's apparently something within the heads up display of, a, of a, an aircraft pilot and he's following it, uh, you wouldn't know what it was. Mm -hmm. uh, there's not enough there to go on. Would it be fair to say uh, you're mildly sceptical? Well, like this, this touches on the, the bigger problem. Mm -hmm. We haven't found any real evidence of life anywhere else in the universe. Now, fair enough, we haven't been able to go anywhere else in the universe to look, so all we can do is look out there. We've been to the moon, we've had spacecraft land on Mars, uh, and some of those missions there now, which are part of their mission is to detect or attempt to detect evidence for past or maybe even current life on Mars. Mm -hmm. And we're not expecting Martians to come up and wave at the cameras. We're looking for things like bacteria. And microbes yeah. and that sort of thing. Um, but we haven't even found that. There's some suggestions, like some of the gases could be explained by some sort of biological process, but nothing. And when we turn our radio telescopes out into space, we don't hear anything. There's been a couple of wow signal, there was the wow signal some years ago, but it's never, we don't know what it was, but it wasn't necessarily communication. Mm -hmm. Now there's a problem because the universe has been around for a long time. And if life pops up pretty much wherever it can, and there are a lot of places, presumably, where it could exist. Yeah, I was going to ask you about the Goldilocks zone. Yeah, you see. Yeah. Uh, well, to, to just explain how many places it could exist, the Goldilocks zone is that region around a star where the temperature is not too hot to cause water to evaporate mm -hmm. and not too cold for it to be constantly frozen. So it's that where you've got liquid water. Yep. And for life as we know it, so to speak, we think that liquid water is a pretty basic need. So we now can fairly confidently say that there are planets around most stars. Now that's a lot of planets. Yep. Now if only a very tiny percentage of those we're in that so-called Goldilocks zone. That's still a lot of planets mm -hmm. in the Goldilocks zone. Now, if only a tiny percentage of those were had, had the conditions suitable, because it's not just temperature, it's got to be a rocky planet, presumably. Yep. Uh, there's lots of other stuff. But only a tiny percentage of those have the right conditions for life to occur. And if only a tiny percentage of those, life did actually pop up, that's still going to be a huge number They'd still of be millions, potential, be, potentially. Uh, potential habitable planets. Now, there's a lot can go wrong. Uh, you know, a few hundred million years ago, not, not a few hundred million, about 68 million years ago, some quite successful large animals here on Earth were pretty much wiped out by an asteroid impact. Uh, the dinosaurs. So that sort of thing can happen. Maybe you know, there are planets where life might be getting established and it gets completely wiped out. But the point is that of all of those, surely somewhere there would be a planet that the conditions have been right to get creatures of a, a similar, not like us, they'd be, part, they'd be creatures of that planet, but that may have developed technologies and uh, sitting around discussing whether there is life anywhere else. Elsewhere. Are we as a species arrogant or naive to think that given there could be so many of these Earth-like planets, that are we naive to think that we're potentially alone, do you think? Well, you know, the, this, is, this is this problem because there should be lots out there. Mm -hmm. And something should have by now been able to pretty much colonise the universe. 
So when we turn our radio telescopes up there and we listen, we should hear, you would think, yep. some noise from that. But we don't. Um, now, maybe we're not listening hard enough. Maybe because of those incredible distances and, and you know, say, a radio signal, for example, it gets weaker the further it goes. So, yeah, maybe we just haven't got sensitive enough equipment yet. But, yeah, there e there's either life out there or there isn't. Both of them are pretty mind-boggling concepts. Yes. Yeah, coming back to the... Uh, the potential for life de to develop to a technologically advanced level on other worlds. Presumably, that life would be similar in a, in a very broad sense to life here. It, mm -hmm. you know, things would have bodies made of stuff similar to us. And they'd die and they'd get buried over by, uh, by sediments and whatnot as they're through the eons on their planets. And those planets would end up with stuff pretty similar to oil and coal. Okay. And presumably any life form developing along a path similar to us that needed more and more energy would discover this oil and coal and do pretty much the same as us. And maybe a common fate of developing uh, civilizations is that they do make a mess of their nest. And maybe there's a warning in that for us. Mm -hmm. So when this government report gets released, is that something you'll be reading? Oh, I hope I'll be able to find some time to uh, have a look at it. I'm, I'm in here on my own at the moment, so uh, there's a lot to do. But, but yes, I'll uh, certainly have a look at it. Um, just. Uh, that's another part, getting back to your earlier question about what do you do in a planetarium. You've got mm -hmm. to keep uh, across all that's going on. Even uh, some of the weirder fringe stuff, you need to at least know what that stuff is uh, so as you can have a response to it. And uh, this report, is not uh, I'm not putting that in the weird fringe stuff. You know, these are uh, uh, sightings that... Uh, you know, better brains than I haven't been able to come up with an adequate explanation for. So that'll be worth looking at. Um, but as I said before, I don't expect that uh, I'm no, going to no see bombshells. evidence of something that is going to answer any real big questions. Now, speaking of questions, if there was someone out there who had an interest in what we're talking about today or maybe astronomy in general, where's a good place for them to, to start that learning journey? Well, the best place, of course, around here is to come into the planetarium. We've got this wonderful projector and we've also got our digital system where we can use uh, to sh help answer a lot of other questions. Uh, all of our shows, they, they appear to be a movie, uh, the way it's presented, because we've, we've just marketed that way. Mm -hmm. But the important part is after the movie, when we fire up the Zeiss, we look at the night sky, we open the, uh, the, the room up to questions and uh, I basically answer, or attempt to answer any of the questions that come from the floor. And we never know where that might lead uh, in the course of the conversation. So what shows do you have on at the moment here? We're trying a bit of a different format at the moment with our shows, so we've got quite a few different shows that we're cycling through to uh, try and uh, change the mix. Our newest shows, uh, one of our newest is The Birth of Planet Earth, which is a great show. Mm -hmm. um, touches on some of what we've talked about, touches on how life developed here and the conditions that, that allowed our planet to produce us. Mm -hmm. um, it, it, it isn't just a straightforward thing of here we've got a planet in the, in the Goldilocks zone, therefore we've got life. There's uh, things like the moon, for example. Uh, there's some great scenes in Birth of Planet Earth where uh, a Mars-sized body, uh, given the name of Thea, collides with the, uh, the young Earth 
the, the, the body that was forming the Earth. It wasn't the Earth as we know it, because this is early on in the formation process. But that collision is our best explanation yet for how we got the moon. Now, if we didn't have the moon... No yeah, tides. No tides. Mm -hmm. And with no tides, would life have ever come out of the oceans in the first place? The first things to come out of the oceans probably didn't decide to come out. They probably got left as the tide went out. Okay. Um, so, yeah, a lot of things come together to make the conditions right. Excellent. So that's, that's a great show. Um, but we have uh, a lot of others. Some history, uh, Capcom Go is quite a good show, looking back at the Apollo mission from 50 years ago. It's a new movie. Um, and uh, I'm actually starting one uh, probably uh, in August, I think, uh, on uh, climate change, uh, our living climate. That's very topical. Which, uh, yes, so it's not as big on astronomy as such, but you know, it's looking at the conditions on a planet orbiting around the sun. It's still, mm -hmm. yeah, astronomy covers just about everything. Uh, we can do a lot. Excellent. Well, thank you for spending time with us today. I really appreciate giving us your insights into all these amazing questions that are going to be asked very soon. Good.